Ah, we're live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. Uh, as you can see, we're going to be talking about uh, recruitment models, whether you are a 360 year or a factory model. I'm sure you'll find this interesting. I'm joined today by the magnificent Mike Ames. Well, we can only see his head because he's accidentally wearing camouflage. So, hi, Mike. How are you doing? I'm oh, very good, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wore this so you wouldn't be able to see me really, just the, just the head floating. But it doesn't seem to have worked out because my curtains are, in fact, orange. But um, <laughs> welcome, and I'm really, I'm really pumped up about this show. You know, we, we've got Ben Shorter on with us today. There he is. Hi, Ben. Hey, you guys, how's it going? You all right? Uh, I, I think that uh, it was difficult to explain because you're a recruiter, obviously, you've got that background, but you're an entrepreneur. And because I've been on the show, a podcaster. So you're lots of things, aren't you? You are the modern man, I think. Definitely. I like to, I'm like ADHD. I like to do lots of different things. Probably why I, I did quite well in contract recruitment. I like lots yeah. of things going on. I think, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that's the case. I bet you did very well in contract recruitment. So we're going to discuss 360 versus factory model. Um, so over to you, Kirst. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get everybody started. So those of you who are watching, please let us know in the comments whether you run a 360 business model or you run a factory model. So the way that this is going to work, I'm wearing my referee T-shirt today. Um, and although Mike and Ben have both said that they see the advantages for both, we're going to sort of play devil's advocate a little bit. And Mike's going to be fighting for the factory team and Ben's going to be fighting for the 360. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get, and Mike, I'm coming to you first. This, I keep on pointing the wrong way. Uh, we're going to come to you about what's the first thing that you think your model has the better edge on. So Mike, first of all, why should somebody choose a factory model? Okay. Easier to build, safer, and people like it because one of the things that we know recruiters hate, despite them billing themselves as 360 so they can earn more and get a better job, is that a lot of people are really rubbish at winning high value new clients and a whole bunch of others are in fact rubbish at getting vacancies. They're okay filling the vacancies when they've got them. They're okay if a vacancy comes their way. They're very good at that, but they're not really the full 360 model and it makes them stressed and eventually they leave. You know, because they're looking for a place where they don't have to do that. Apart from that, it's, you know, the 360. It sounds model. fantastic. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> right. OK, Ben. So Mike started us off with a very, very strong one there. For you, what's what's sort of the biggest benefit for a 360 model? Ben? I think where the market is so hyper competitive and marketplace knowledge is so important to clients. Someone who's a good 360, because when they're speaking to candidates all the time, they will have really leading marketplace insights they're not selling just a recruitment solution they're trying to find solutions to a wider business's problems mm. okay interesting mike what do you think about that i sadly happen to agree with that <laughs> We're off this, to is, a not, this is not going to be the no. match that i'd envision guys uh, no it, it it is i i think that um the the thing you've got to remember really about 360s is, is that everybody that runs their own recruitment business or starts their own recruitment business almost everybody 99.9 percent .9 are great 360s so it is great 360 is great there is no doubt about it it's efficient because there's there's also a good deal less um, communications that goes on you know so people speak to candidates they get an idea of there's an opportunity they ring up and chase the opportunity it's awesome however it's not really very safe because at some point if they're really good 360s they're going to go like you did, like other people do. And they're going to take a big chunk of your business with them. So this is one of my, you know, favorite quotes there. If, if you've got some 360s in your team, you're looking at the future competition right there. And I think that's dangerous, really dangerous, personally. I, I actually, I, I agree with what you're saying. You are effectively setting up your competition. But I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think this is a, something we, we've spoke about in the past as a, differences in, in terms of generationally like within my team if someone's a great 360 and they want to leave that's fine people are naturally going to leave but as a business owner i'm thinking okay how can i create something with them because i'm really entrepreneurial so if someone in my team wants to set their own business i'm thinking oh i can potentially add value to them and get a shareholder in another business which means that in some ways i've got less competition in the future i think that's really interesting that's a very refreshing uh, slant on it that you and I have discussed on your show actually or we talked about that but I think the vast majority of business owners if someone leaves 
in their mind, they become the enemy. <clears throat> They're not as enlightened as you. And I'm not being facetious when I say that. Um, and so you, they go, they take their clients with them. Their view as well is they don't go to their boss and say, I'm thinking of leaving in competition. Can we have yeah. like a joint deal? They're going to keep it sly as we all did. Everyone did, right? Keep it on the on the QT, set up their business, get it all ready, go. Take who they're going to take with them, and then they're in competition. And a big chunk of that business, someone once said to me, a big chunk of business goes from me, but it doesn't always go to the other person who's leaving. It just goes, really. And I think that happens quite a bit. And I just think it's – it's you can just see it. It's very hard to get 360 recruiters. It's very hard to hire them, very hard to train them up. And if, if they do go, and they're very hard to keep if they're really good – then they are going to take that big chunk of your business with them. And I think that is an enlightened approach to say, well, okay, can we do some sort of joint venture? But, uh, you know, it's not always the case, is it, really, when that happens? No, of course. And I, I think that this is the thing, like, the, it's, as we sort of said at the beginning, we kind of probably both flip on both sides. I think one thing that you said there, which is key, is training people. Now, if someone's engaged in your business and you're developing them, you can find a way of keeping them. However... The, the reality is to train someone as a, a 360, you have to train them on more parts because recruitment, if anything, it's become more complex as the market's evolved. What we expect a resourcer to be able to do on the phone now is very different to, to maybe 15, 20, 30 years ago. Like, let's say, for example, one of my resources is recruiting for a really niche technical position. They have to go and understand that technology a little bit so they can have an informed conversation with the client. Or candidate, sorry. Then equally, there's so many caveats to what they do. So it's actually easier to train it if you separate the processes. But you're more likely to keep someone if you've invested that time into training and developing them and making sure that they're aligned to your long-term vision as well. I, I, can I just bring up a couple of slides that I've got? Because I, I really want to drill into that. I think that is a really, really important point that you've just raised. The whole kind of development and training thing. And I just want to, if I can just bring up. Um, you guys are being far too agreeable. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with him any minute now, right? So this is a stylized version of the 360 model. Let's just get our definitions on the board. I know this is very simplified. Okay, fair enough. But it's pretty much there. And people are good at different things, which is what the size tick is supposed to be. And it does vary, obviously, according to what your experiences and your natural tendency. But that's a 360 model. And you're always going to get variable amounts of revenue coming from it. The, the factory model means that one person does a whole bunch of things, but all in the same silo. And as you can see here, this guy is doing lead, lead conversion and account management, which is very common to have the same person doing both of those roles. And then delivery obviously inter interacts with the client as well obviously, because they're arranging interviews and getting requirements and things, but they're not the account manager, which is a completely different set kettle of fish. But I'll tell you what's interesting is we did some work on this some time ago to identify different characteristics. We did some research, quite a good project, really. And what we discovered was <clears throat> characteristics, generally speaking, of a, uh, a new, new client acquisition, which is the front end, versus a client account management, which is the back end. They're almost exactly opposite, weirdly. Mm -hmm. right? There is a lot of conflict going on there. And yeah, you, you can get people who've got all of those skills or can switch from one to another. They can sometimes be an extrovert and sometimes an introvert when it's called for it. But it's very rare. You're building a business model based on hiring people who are very, very rare. You know, it just is the deal. And I think that, interestingly enough, when when you look at something like that, I think it makes it realize just how bloody hard it is to find people who've got it all. Do you not think? Definitely. I think one of the things that almost I said again, like straight away when we started speaking was if someone wants to own a recruitment business, they need to be able to look at each part and understand it so that they can then ensure that the processes are correct within their business. So it's where like I am pro 360s is because I, I like people to be entrepreneurs and want to chase that type of dream. And I think the only way to do it in recruitment is if you have an understanding of, of all parts. I know people that have gone and set up a business, then thought, ah, now I don't have my delivery team. What do I do? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of truth in, in that too. But in fact, there is a lot of truth. I don't think there is. What you've said is absolutely bang on. But this idea of training someone, I always feel if you train someone in less, they become an expert more in that thing. 
And if you're trying to draw on all of those different skills that you need to do 360, I mean, the massive amounts, the ability to identify and understand what a, an ideal client looks like, to start a dialogue with them, or if you're going to get down the, the vacancy hunting stage, which is a different set of skills. But at the same time, then they've got to be able to resource, manage a process very easily. I think it's so hard to train somebody in all of that. I, I kind of think where I'm going with this, I think, is to start off, if you like, at 360, although I prefer to start people as resources, really, yeah. teach them the very basics, purely because that's what the client is actually buying, really, at the end of the day. They're buying some qualified candidates, and that's what the resource is fine for you. But then I think you should specialise based upon where your characteristics are and the strong you are in one thing or another. That's what you should focus on and be awesome at it. I think you're happier and more productive if you do that. I can't can't disagree with you in any way, shape, or form. There, I've got a bell to <laughs> ring and everything. You're ruining it for me. We should have brought in Jean Claude because he's, you know, he's yeah, very. Good. Okay, I have I have a question. I have a question regarding the sort of um, 360 versus um, factory model. When it comes to scalability, because that's something that we at Flair talk about a, a lot. When growing your business and, and making it so that it's a situation where it sort of grows and grows in a way that works for you. Is there something to be said about having a 360 um, model to do that because other people do it for you? Or is there something about, you know, because people are leaving, it's difficult to sort of make that forecast on scalability? Ben, I'm going to come to you first. Cool. I mean, look, what I've done within the businesses that I've launched since the pandemic is get people that are 360 first. So they're able to acquire new clients and work with those clients. But then as we develop, we would move more towards a factory model. Interesting. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. So, so starting with the 360 and then sort of growing into it. That's interesting. Mike, what about you? A, a couple of things, really. First of all, I, I would say this is that there is a difference between lead gen and vacancy hunting. And I, it took me ages to realize when a lot of people in the agency world were talking about lead gen or BD, they were actually talking about hunting vacancies. And I don't think that. I think you build relationships with people and the requirements come to you as opposed to hunting requirements, eating them and then going hunting some more. You know, I think there's a big difference. And 360, if you're vacancy hunting, is a good deal easier. You hit the phones, basically, and eventually you get lucky. You kiss a frog that turns into a prince and that's OK. But if you want to develop relationships with high value clients so that you're in a position to constantly feed off them, that is a completely different skill set. It's very rare. And I think those people that have it almost always end up running a business. And why would you build a model that needs that? Because it just isn't scalable. You can't get enough people that can do that. So you end up with, and this is why there are 40,000 recruitment companies in this country. 39,000 of them are tiny. They're either one-man bands, about 20,000 of them, or the other 19,000 are about, on average, about kind of half a million to 70, 750,000 pound fee base. So why is that? It's because they're trying to build a model, a scalable model on something that intrinsically isn't scalable. Whereas a factory model, you know, you, you need someone to do lead gen, which is relatively simple, quite frankly. You need someone to start a dialogue with high value clients harder. But when you infuse your system with tools to do that, I don't mean software tools, by the way. But when you infuse it with tools, it suddenly becomes easier because the 360 model does de-skill lead gen. And then you get people that do a function. It's their function that they do. And if they leave, you lose a function. You don't lose a revenue stream. It's completely different. All of those things are more scalable in a factory model. I think what it comes down to is often the business owners themselves. Like as someone that was delivering training, often I would go into businesses and say, okay, what's your target market what what clients you look, want to acquire and they're like, they're very much led by the consultant and i think that that's often a problem with business owners like good the best 360 consultants that i've ever seen through my career are able to identify what their core time uh, client demographic is and almost businesses regardless of whether they're doing 360 or factory model they need to understand okay what clients they want to acquire that's and right. do they model that supports that and I think that's probably the overarching problems with businesses doing the 360 model is they laissez-faire it. Like if you look at me, I'm sat on our CRM system all the time looking up what clients have been added to the system. And then I'm thinking, OK, is that a client that we can acquire in the long term? And why would I want us to acquire, acquire that type of client? 
is it a, a business fit for us? Can we service what their needs are? And I think that's what I loved about one of the things you said to me before, Mike, it's chasing relationships, not placements, and chasing the right relationships within the yeah. right businesses. That either way, if you go factory model or 360, but a business owner, you're not really clear about who your client dem demographic is, then ultimately you, the reason why you struggle to be successful is because you're relying on other people to be better than you at that. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I know we're going to go to questions in a minute because we've got some coming in. Could I also ask people to put things in there in defense of 360? So put put whatever, put some good things in about 360, things you believe in and things that you know work. Put those in the in the comments if you don't mind. And we'll come to questions in just a second. But I, I think that's th this concept of having an ideal client profile or several ideal client profiles according to the markets that you target or the products that you sell is absolutely crucial in a factory model. 100%. Because you're basically saying to the lead gen people, go and get me some leads that correspond to this criterion or criteria. And if the criteria isn't accurate or is fuzzy, then you'll get leads that aren't accurate or are fuzzy. If you want it to be sharp, you've got to give them a very, very accurate ideal client profile. I, that, I mean, you're right with 360s, of course. It's just that in a 360 model as well, I think there is this belief, I'll hunt until I catch and then I'll feed off it and then I'll hunt again. Whereas in a factory model, someone's hunting all the time. And that time and the consistency of touch points and focus and energy builds up a momentum and it wins more clients, hence it's more scalable. Kirst, should we go to questions now? Yeah, I mean, we've had we've had a couple of, a couple of things in. So uh, Simon's come, he said that he's a factory advocate or that he's 180, 180, but he has said, He's here to be swayed. So I'd like to see, I'd like to wonder, Simon, has anything kind of skewed you one way or another? Is it made you glad you're in a factory model or are you thinking maybe a couple more 360s in your business model? And Matt's got a really good point here. So he sort of mentioned what you said, Ben, is he, he sort of started as a 360 to get that momentum going, you know, to, to drive the business forward. But then he's continued to move as his business has got to a better, more manageable, scalable size. He's sort of moving it towards the factory model. And I think that's a really... I think it's a, a good thing to realize that in business, just because you start as one thing doesn't mean you have to stay. Can I, just, can I pick up on that point that Matt's made? Because I know Matt's business. I know kind of the journey he's on. And his business is very efficient, 360 model. But I think he's obviously recognized that to scale up, you've got to change to a factory model because it's so difficult to scale a 360 model. It just is massively difficult. And I think that's why most people don't grow their recruitment businesses above 750,000 fees or whatever is that they can't make that transition they they come from a big outfit which is 360s a lot of big outfits are 360s or claim to be at least and they used to work in in a certain way so they replicate that in a small business but the difference is they don't have the resources and the brand name and all of the functions that support a 360 model in a bigger businesses they don't have them in the small business so they power away till they've exhausted their network and got everyone fired up around them. And then they hit a blocker and you see it all the time. I'd say probably 90% of my clients have hit that blocker and it's like, I can't seem to get it forward because they're trying to perpetuate a model that doesn't scale. But I think one of the things with that is it comes down to the culture of a business. Like recruitment as an industry, it's a team sport, but it's played by individuals. And, and that's the problem throughout the industry it's we've got lots of people who are competitive that want to win by themselves we judge them on our own performance and not the businesses and then ultimately we end up with lots of siloed individuals doing one thing and and that's not necessarily best for a business it's something that i said in a recent meeting with my team our team target is a lot more important than individual targets mm. like massively yeah. if because I want people to be able to achieve within that role. And I, I think if I'm looking at the the future, it is resources and account managers being treated the same as people that win business. Like I, I've seen it skewer quite a lot where the particularly in really sort of niche marketplaces, a resources getting a hundred pound bonus, the salesperson's getting a thousand pound bonus. Yet the only reason that a salesperson is able to get that thousand pound bonus is because of the resources network. Oh they, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, we we haven't got time to debate the reward mechanisms <laughs> for either model. I wish we did. We perhaps we will in another show. But but I tell you, 
the 360 get paid a lot kind of belief is because they can go and win business and then bring it back and satisfy it. Mm -hmm. And a few people can do that. Yeah, for sure. But a lot of people can only really feed off accounts that they're given. So I don't see why they should get paid the big dosh for that. To me, I, I think I'm not saying it's easy to do recruitment because it isn't to do it well. It's not easy, really. But I know it's really hard to find good candidates. I know that, especially when you've got a lot of candidates on the market. You'd think it was easier, but it isn't because there's more frogs to kiss before you get your prints, you know. So I think it's a real skill. Years ago, um, IBM had a two grades, one for programmers and one for analysts. And you basically went through the programming grade. And then when you got to the top of it, you became an analyst. But they discovered, and the analysts got paid more, they discovered that programmers didn't necessarily make good analysts and vice versa. So they split them up and they made them parallel. So a junior programmer got paid the same as a junior analyst. A programmer got paid the same as an analyst and so on and so forth. And that revolutionized the way in which they developed because they realized that the skill, you needed both of them. And you need really good programmers and you need really good analysts. One isn't better than the other. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same in this. I think if you get a really good resource, so I'd pay him huge amounts of money. If you can go out and find me that really obscure skill that this client wants, damn it, I'll pay you what you need. If you've got someone else that can just manage an account with a, with a client and pick up vacancies when they email through, pay them the same. Why wouldn't I? I know it's, that's another simplification. But. Yeah, so I think it's a good thing. I think it ties in with this comment from Simon that I brought up is that it does have different strengths and you shouldn't, just because one has a closer link to the money, I suppose, just so often yeah. the way in recruitment well, yeah, doesn't yeah. mean it shouldn't be shouldn't be rewarded. We've actually got some really, really good comments going in. This is an interesting one, again, from Simon, which I think is, do you think, because obviously, Ben, you're, <clears throat> I'm not going to say a lot younger than Mike. Let's just say younger. Let's just leave it at younger. I could be his granddad. Let's just leave it at younger. Let's not get mean about anybody on this level. But do you think that there is a generational thing, you know, that that sort of because certain younger people are more on a purpose, they're less, should we say less selfish? No, let's not, let's not use the word selfish. Let's, let's use the word self-focused. Okay. Do you think there is a sort of part to be played in that? Do you think recruitment in the future will be different with sort of different generations? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, to an extent where there's me and some competing businesses that actually split fee with each other. Like we, we are technically competitors, but yeah, we, we're often a similar age groups. We talk to each other about the marketplace. And then like so they've, confused. Got, they've got a client that they can't service, rather than them lose the vacancy, there's mm. nothing wrong with them splitting it with me. See, yeah. I, I think that's the right way. That's the mature way. Kirsty, <laughs> what were you taught as a child about competition? If you see someone drowning, push harder. Yes, yeah. <laughs> if you see a competitor drowning, push harder. That's how they were taught. I'm not saying that was the right <laughs> thing to do in the 90s. I'm just saying that was the role. You know, that's how it was. They're the competition. We'll crush them. I think yours is a more mature and better model, if you don't mind me saying so. I think that's one way the recruitment has got better. But on, on Simon's point, I think that's really important. Nowadays, if you want to get people, they good people, and keep them, if you want to build a successful business, keeping your team together is a key element of that. Why would you get them to do things that they really don't like doing? They don't feel it's them. They don't feel it matches their skill sets. They're not interested in it. You make them do it because your model says you need to be 360. Madness. And I, I'm all in favor of Generation Z, X, whatever it is, curse that you lot are. But why? I'm a why. why? Why? Why are they? I don't know. But, but, and this is an important point, I think, is to me, that's right. They're right. Your generation have got it right. I want to do this. I can be awesome at it. Just let me do it. But why wouldn't you do that? It just seems amazing to me that you would do anything else. And I think this is where I then switch to the factory model. Like everyone is going to have a different talent, a different skill set within recruitment. I have got a, a consultant within my team who does bits of BD, brings work on, but it's not something he enjoys. And getting him to make a cold call is something that I wouldn't, I wouldn't even go there. But do they still do cold calls? Do I, people still do cold calls? Still. It depends how you define cold. Like for me, oh, a cold teasing. call is teasing. I'm calling. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the thing, though. There's lots of arguments about it. And I think this is where recruitment has changed a lot. Like for me, a cold call is me trying to call someone who maybe hasn't heard of me or they've only seen me through social media and LinkedIn. It doesn't mean I'm calling for a phone book and said, "Hello, oh, have you got any recruitment that I can help with?" <laughs> which, which, to be fair, is how I started. 
I did too. I did too. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I have an interesting question for you guys, actually. Uh, listening to you speak, I've been in and around recruitment. Obviously, Mike's my dad, so I've been around recruitment my whole life, and, I, and I've worked in recruitment. And we have a lot of recruitment clients. When you speak to 360 recruiters, how many of those do you think are actually 360 recruiters? Because I think sometimes you get people who are told they are and they only like to resource. <laughs> Or they get people who say they are, but they really like to hunt business. That's their favorite thing to do. How many do you think actually are 360s? Yeah, I, when I was classed as a 360 recruiter, I wasn't a 360 recruiter. <laughs> I, I had I got given some accounts and then I made friends with those people in the accounts who then introduced me to other people that they had that were in a similar position to them. So my idea of winning new business was me going into a meeting, like saying, oh, hey, uh, do you know anyone else that I could call tomorrow because I've got to do some sales calls and they'll say yeah Ben call this person at this warehouse and, and tell them that, that you know me through, through recruitment so I'll call them up and say oh I work with Hugh who's the manager at this warehouse supporting him with these stuff he said it might be worth giving you a call and that, that was how I did BD but I didn't do like new BD I wasn't hunting vacancies I was building relationships so I wasn't you and I are the on that program. really aren't we you and I that's one thing we share I'm a relationship salesman but a hunter so I would decide who I wanted to be a client and I wouldn't give up until I got them or they tell me to off or whatever it was. But in fact, even then it was like, how should I off? <laughs> you know, so do you want me to come back next month? Is that what you're saying? No, I wasn't that bad, but, but very much a hunter, but I agree with you when I wanted to build is relationships. And so therefore my time horizon like yours is much longer than the end of the month warriors that are in there for three sixties where they're going to get some money. I understand that. But I think having a, Having part of your business focus on the end of the month or the end of the next month or two months is no bad thing. That's where the money comes from. Awesome. I think you need a bunch of other people, though, that their time horizons are much longer, months or even years, because that's where the big bickies are. You chase the higher value clients who are happy with their existing supplier base, and gradually you kind of ease your way in there. And then when you're in, you cook your way through and get rid of everyone else so you're the man hombre. That's how you build a very scalable business. That's the route. Can I just give a shameless, shameless plug? Would you mind? I'll allow it. Depends. Next, next week on the 24th, we're running a webinar where we're going to talk about the factory model in depth. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants a link to that, just put that in the comments and we'll send it to you. We'll also amend the post from that promotes this to include that as well. So you've got the link. It's free and everything. There's no catch to it, but it's we've already got 120 odd people, 130 people registered for it. So it's a very popular webinar. I'm going to explain how the factory model works in depth. So if you're interested in that, let us know and we'll invite you. No problem. Sorry about that. Just dived I'll in. I'll allow that. I'll allow that. So I do have just a couple more comments I want to bring up and then I have a sort of a final round of questions. I'm going to try and find something sort of tangible at the end of this because this has been- We have four minutes to do that. I I believe in me, I've got the power. So first of all, Alejandro said, uh, he thinks it's come down to some consultants, particularly 360s, I think, is that they're sold a lie uh, because they're told they can run a business within a business. Hang on, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And he says that if you hire the right people and give them the incentive to stay, rewarding them well um, and giving them enough responsibility, then you can retain 360. If people are leaving for the money, I didn't leave for the money, took a huge pay drop. I left for the, a whole bunch of other reasons. You know, I'm not saying it was ego. So you go. And also the power, right? So I agree with what you've said there. Look after people, but it ain't just always the money. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we've got, I don't know if this, because this is the first person to say I agree with. So I don't know if this means that Ben's won. I don't, I don't, I don't want to <laughs> put that out there. Right. But um, I think actually this is sort of the point that, that I think a, a, most of what has been made today is that there is a case for both. And, you know, 360s have their place and there are certain people who are, I think, intrinsically just built that way, who, who can manage the whole scenario. And those people may go off and be future business leaders themselves. That doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. If you're like Ben, if you're like Mike, then you throw stones at them. But that's beside the point. Um, but I think the factory model at a certain point is what happens when your business gets to a certain size. Or maybe you want to take a step back and you want to have more free time because you know 360 recruitment is, a, is an all-encompassing thing so I think what what's what's come out of this is that both of you have pretty much made the case for both aspects of it is that would you agree on that yeah. well I'm going to say on camera I agree with it <laughs> 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 I guess I know that's good but 
No, no, no. I'm all about the factory. No, to be fair, I'll, I'll finish where I started. 360 has its place for sure. It's the most efficient way of building a business to a certain point. I just think it's hard to scale. And I think it's based on a business model on people you can't really get. And if they go, they are going to hurt you. They're going to take some of your business with them. And a lot of the people you employ are not going to be as enlightened as Ben's people who say to him, can we talk about this? They're just going to go and take your business with them. Well, you never know, they might be in the future. More gender. <laughs> and and look, I, I think for me, like the, the factory model is the way to go for a long-term business plan. Mm -hmm. But for individuals, it's good for them to experience 360. However, I will say this, people should always resource first before even trying to speak to clients. Can we finish on that? Because I agree with that 100%. <laughs> okay, Start with resourcing, become more somatic before you do anything else. Okay, I am gonna have. Oh, sorry, just to even this up, we have got somebody who's on who's on the factory model side as well. Richard, thank you for for sharing that with us. Um, he said, <laughs> well, "It's a draw, then. It's a draw." So what I will say is, if somebody is in a situation where maybe they have a three hundred and sixty and they want to go to a, a factory model, or maybe they have only a factory model and they want to incorporate some three hundred and sixties, the either of you or both of you have just one little piece of advice to help that person or give them a, a question to answer to help them think. So Mike, I'm going to come to you first, then I'll give you some more time. Yeah, go for Mike, just dob him in straight. Okay, okay, so I would say, um, if you want to start to build a factory model, begin with the ICP, define the ideal client profile. And you could argue it's the same for 360, but I think it's the first step. When we have an eight, eight step process to build a, a factory, and the first step is that, you define your ideal client profile. So you understand the kind of people that you're hunting, because everything stems from that. Perfect. Thank you very much. And um, Ben, what about you? So if you're moving from 360 to factory, you need to understand every single aspect of a 360 and build a very clear process around it. So you know exactly what a person is doing or what good resourcing looks like, what finding a candidate looks like, what the best practices for business development. I'd be very core within your processes. Perfect. Wow, guys, I think that was I think that was a really good show. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I, I really enjoyed listening to it. But um, I think it was really, really fantastic. I think both of you had really good points of view. We got some great comments. Thank you, everybody, to got, who got involved. We really appreciate it here. What are we doing next week? What are we doing next week? Next week, we it's just me and Mike. Um, and we're talking about how being lazy is good for your business. And I'm a big fan. Can't wait for that one. Well, we're all excited about that. I am equally lazy and ambitious in equal measures. And I think it's a great combination. So <laughs> great. So uh, thank you so much to everybody who watched. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Mike, even though, you know, we can only see him from the neck up with his camouflage top. And uh, thank you to Ben, who um, you've been really great on the show. You've given us a lot to think about. And I feel really inspired by you. And I, I think that's a, a great way to end the show. Oh, thank you so much. Gen Y sticking together. I know what's going on here. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. Thank you.